Third Meeting, Tuesday, June 11th, 1974. Questions and Answers First Question, Woman 1. I have read one of your books and came across the terms Jitta Vimutti and Buddha Vimutti. What do they mean? Answer. Jitta Vimutti is the term generally used for whatever Jitta has freed itself from the Gilesas and become Arahant. Buddha Vimutti is the term which is used only in referring to the Jitta of the Buddha. They both mean that the Jitta is pure. Second question. Woman 1. I have read in a book that there are six consciousnesses, vinyarna, that is, contact of the six external sense objects, ayatana, with the six internal sense bases, and that there is also a seventh consciousness. What is this other one? Answer. The six consciousnesses are the six external sense objects coming in contact with eyes, ears, nose, etc., and then knowing in other words, one knows that this or that thing has come in contact. This is the characteristic of the jitta. The seventh consciousness is Bhartisante Vinyarna, which does not become aware of anything but takes birth, Bhartisante, in a plane which is high or low at such and such a time and place, depending on the causes which lead it on which are in the jitta. There is therefore a new birth or rebirth. The Buddha taught us about the six consciousnesses so that we would not cling to things which we see and know, and so that we would know that they just arise and fall away, there being no permanent essence in them. When we can supervise them, we will be able to see the seventh vinyarna more clearly. There is only one form of this consciousness, and it is ega vinyarna. To make an analogy, it is like the trunk of a tree, and this is the part that matters when we want to make use of a tree. The other six consciousnesses are then like the branches and twigs, which we cannot make much use of. We should therefore keep this in mind and take an interest in contemplating the one jitta, eka jitta, which will take birth. We should also try to look after the jitta and make it clean, and raise it as high as we can in accordance with our own level, which we have gained from doing practice. Third question, man one. Vinyarna means one who knows, and Bhartisanti Vinyarna means the jitta which is covered with both wholesomeness and unwholesomeness, gozala and agozala, and which takes rebirth. So, to make an analogy, when you build a house, it is better to be interested in the most important part of the house rather than the little insignificant things outside. Is looking at it in this way correct? Answer. That is correct. But you must contemplate the things that are connected with the jitta until you understand them, and then let go of them. Contemplate them in conjunction with the jitta, which is the chief, the important one, until you understand both those things that are small and those that are great. Then contemplate all around in all aspects. Fourth question, man two. The jitta is the one that knows generally when we think about this or that, bringing these things together as sankharas, compounded things, which are anitta, impermanent. But yesterday you said that the jitta exists, that it is permanent. Would you please explain more about this? Answer. In general, the jitta of the ordinary person is impermanent, and it is permeated with mundane conventions. All things in the world which are mundane naturally come under the three characteristics of existence, which are impermanence, anitta, discontent, dukkha, and not-self, anatta. The jitta of the ordinary person still comes in this category. That is, it must change according to what is wholesome and unwholesome which leads to rebirth. The jitta that does not change, which is permanent, is the jitta which is pure, which has attained to the state of arahanship. It no longer has impermanence, discontent, and not-self permeating it like the jitta of the ordinary person. An explanation such as this is theoretical knowledge, pariyatti, and it might lead to endless arguments if you have not practiced. So talking about it and discussing it will not bring much benefit. If you practice and come to see the truth of Tamma for yourself, Reading, listening, and discussing will lead to understanding, but if you have not practiced accordingly, it will just go in the direction of argument. 
The Thamma of the Lord Buddha has levels which are gross, middle, or subtle, and it is always better to speak about those things which have value. What can be obtained from reading, and what can be obtained from practice, are quite different from each other, because remembering what we have read is quite different from the truth that has been experienced from practice. Even when other people speak of the results from their practice, it is difficult for us to understand them until we have practiced and experienced more with our hearts. Then our doubts will clear up by themselves. Fifth question, Man 2. Is there any way to eradicate anger from oneself? Answer. In the Abhidhamma, it is said that anger is the dosa root. If I explain it to you, you will understand my explanation well enough, but actually getting rid of the root of anger is very difficult. You must rely on practice as the main thing, because extracting the gilesas must be done by means of the truth which comes from true practice. You cannot extract them with what comes from your ability to remember what you have learned, which can be remembered well enough by anybody who studies, for the gilesas are not afraid of this. They will still be there as they were before. Regardless of what type of temperament we have, when we practice in order to eliminate the gilesas, we can surely get rid of them. In truth, there were and still are arahants who were once very angry men. We ordinary people merely know and understand this, but we do not yet have the ability to eliminate the root of anger. We must train the jitta to know what a bad fault hatred or dosa really is. Then it will go away by itself. If we try to get rid of it by just wanting it to go, we will not succeed. We must depend on meditation practice. Then we will see results coming steadily, which is called the right kind of meditation that is suitable for the removal of this kind of gilesa. Please understand that the gilesas are not afraid of simply remembering their names. Even though we remember everything about them in great detail, they still remain gilesas which govern the hearts of beings in the world. They do not think about removing themselves to another place unless one practices meditation and develops mindfulness and wisdom so as to be bold and strong enough to be able to drive them out. Then the time comes when they will break and scatter from the heart without any doubt. The Buddha and all his disciples eliminated the gilesas by means of practice. The methods they used have been taught to the world down to the present day. I will explain sitting meditation. Why did the Buddha sit cross-legged in meditation? Looked at superficially, sitting in that position is not very important, so you can sit in any position that you want. But if you are going to sit for hours, then you should sit cross-legged, because the pressure due to the weight of the body will be evenly distributed. When it becomes painful, the pain will be spread out and it will not be excessively painful in any one spot. If you sit for a very long time, then it may become very painful. Since sitting in meditation is extremely important work for those who are determined to get real results, they may sit for a long time, even for many hours. If you become too worried or anxious about your body, then the jitta will be weak. This will depend on the amount of dukkha experienced in the body. It is important to make the jitta one's goal. Let the jitta do the work that is set for it, and have mindfulness and control of the jitta while meditating so that it does not wander outside thinking about this or that. The jitta that is always controlled by mindfulness will remain with oneself. It will be calm and clearly aware. The more you have mindfulness with the jitta, the clearer the jitta will be. You must therefore not allow the jitta to wander or be distracted. Sixth question, Man 3. A meditation teacher by the name of Alakamala has said that if we fix the jitta into a thing, we cannot attain to vimutti. Why is this? Answer. Because things are things, not vimutti. How can the jitta then reach vimutti? We contemplate things not to get them, but to know them and to let go of them. Concerning the path of the arahant, arahatta magga, and the fruition, arahatta pala, and speaking of mindfulness and wisdom as well, if you make use of only mindfulness and do not make use of wisdom, you will not get results that are desirable. 
If you want to be able to eliminate the Kilesas entirely, you must make complete use of mindfulness and wisdom, which are like tools. In making use of tools, you must know what to use with what, the way to use them, and how. Although there may be a lot of mindfulness present, people may still be deficient in doing what is their duty because they do not use wisdom as they ought to. The end result of this is that the full state that should arise does not. Being deficient in what is your duty is not a good thing, so the result you get is not complete. Therefore, one who learns about the middle way should always take into consideration what is sufficient, and thus appropriate to Tamma, which is the middle way that you have learned. Seventh question, Man 3. Must we practice meditation to get a balance? Answer. Practice meditation and see for yourself what is lacking. You should also develop the five indriya, faculties, sadha, faith or confidence, virya, energy, sati, mindfulness, samadhi, concentration, and banya, wisdom, within oneself. When light falls on the surface of an object, the top of that object is illuminated while its underside is in shadow and dark. Wisdom is like the light which can truly penetrate everywhere, but what it penetrates is the gelezas which cover the heart, so that there is not any shadow in the heart where gelezas can hide or conceal themselves. This means that wisdom is powerful and able to investigate circumspectly throughout the darkness of all the gelezas with ease and confidence until the jitta has reached ultimate vimutti, liberation. Eighth question. Venerable Banya Werto. Does this mean that we should carefully examine the five indriya? If wisdom is strong, it will penetrate throughout, like a light which shines completely through an object from top to bottom, so that there is no shadow, which is avidā, ignorance, left at all. Is that correct? Answer. Jitta Vimutti is the completely pure jitta that has no shadow, for it is bright in all respects. If some shadow still remains, one can call that shadow avidā. The important thing is, for the jitta to become pure, all the gilesas must be completely eradicated. Ninth question. Woman 2. I would like to know what the jitta is. Answer. The jitta is the one who knows. The true jitta has only one function, and that is knowing. The Buddha always said that the original true jitta is clear, bright, and resplendent, but the gilesas are mixed or blended with it, and so it follows the way of the gilesas, becoming murky. We must rely on mindfulness, wisdom, and perseverance to cleanse the jitta. When the jitta has gone beyond the state of clarity and brightness, it will be pure, which means that it will have attained to the state of vimutti. The word brightness Babhasara refers here to the state of vartacitta which is different from vivartacitta. In other words, Babhasara is clarity and brightness but is not yet the state of purity. The brightness which comes from meditation practice is due to the gelesas gathering together in just one spot. When the brightness, which is the most subtle aspect of the gelesas, has been passed beyond and overcome by the cleansing process of super-mindfulness, mahasati, and super-wisdom, mahabanya, then the jitta is pure. Tenth question, Man 4. How does one guard the jitta so as to keep it inside oneself? Answer. If we want to know about the jitta, we must practice meditation to make the jitta calm. Wisdom can be made use of both internally and externally, but if wisdom is to arise and be astute, the jitta must be calm. If the jitta is calm, then we can know its characteristics. We should try to maintain the calm of the jitta for as long as possible. Then we will build a firm basis for ourselves, and become so skilled that we will be able to make the jitta calm whenever we want. When the calm jitta becomes continually brighter and brighter, it will know what kilesas are present, and it will have wisdom to extract and eliminate them. The jitta will then become still brighter until it can drive out the kilesas by means of wisdom. This is the first step. 
the knowing that is formed from the Gilesas is not the real jitta, but only a characteristic of the jitta. Gilesas can be coarse, medium, or subtle in nature. We must use wisdom to follow and remove the Gilesas of all three levels. When we have done this until the jitta does not change, is not sad or downhearted, and has none of the characteristics of a jitta covered in Gilesas at all, this jitta will know that there are no causes left for rebirth in the future. The jitta is then pure and need not take birth again. The jitta that has the seeds of goodness and badness within it can be compared to a seed which can grow because it has the germ of life or the potential for development in it. This kind of jitta will therefore be born, die, and be born again and again according to the causes which it has itself made, both good and bad. As for the jitta that is pure, it is constant, unchanging, and the germ of rebirth is no longer present. Regardless of whether you believe that after death there is nothing more, or that after death there is still something, if the jitta has the seeds of goodness and badness present in it, it will be born again endlessly. But if the jitta is pure and has no such seeds, it will not be reborn. This is the way of it. But the permanence, the unchangingness of the pure jitta is not the same permanence that the world understands. So nobody can understand the permanence of the pure jitta correctly except the Arahants. The Buddha practiced until he saw truly for himself. He did not make any wild guesses or just think about it as we do. Therefore the Buddha's Tamma is absolutely correct and we can have absolute confidence in it. If we cannot yet attain to the level of the pure jitta, then we should persist in doing what is good, so that in whatever way the jitta is reborn, it may be in a good way. This will lead to development, and it is far better than clinging to doubt and uncertainty, which so obstructs our way that we live in vain, without gaining anything useful. In that case, we will be swept away or pushed down into a huge mass of dukkha. Eleventh Question, Man 5 must we be born as human beings in order to attain enlightenment? Answer. Other beings do not have mindfulness and wisdom. Human beings have a lot of mindfulness and wisdom, but they must also have more than a normal amount of perseverance and energy before they can be enlightened. Therefore, not all human beings are able to attain enlightenment. Those who are born in the five pure abodes of the Brahma world will be able to attain the highest level of Tamma with much greater certainty than the majority of human beings. If human beings do not make an effort to do good, they are likely to do things which bring them to a lower level. There are four groups of human beings, which can be compared to four lotuses. 1. The group of people who are full of good characteristics and will soon attain enlightenment when they get the right method of Tamma. 2. The second group will attain tamma gradually. They can be compared to those who are sick, but who will be cured if given the proper medicine. 3. The third group needs to be taught many, many times before understanding occurs. They must practice regularly in order to be able to attain. If this group is compared to a sick patient, there is a way for him to be cured if he comes by the right medicine and there is a way in which he can die if he is careless and likes to eat those things that are harmful for him because they nullify the medicine's cure. 4. The last group is least in everything that is good. If it is for the sake of evil, they will fight to their last breath without giving up. Because they are blind to everything, they are not afraid of accumulating dukkha. The jitta is like all other things, trees, children, etc. It needs nourishment so that it will grow and develop. The jitta has to depend on its owner for the way it is nourished, so it will develop accordingly. Ajahn Mahabua's talk. I am very pleased to be able to come here and answer your questions, but I am afraid that my stay here will be rather short. I cannot remain very long due to the many duties which I have waiting for me in Thailand. Thailand is about 80 to 90 percent Buddhist, and I have much to do in the way of meeting people and teaching my followers. It was necessary for me to prepare my work about three or four months in advance before I could actually come to England, 
and it is necessary that I return home quickly, because many people are waiting for me there. I am very pleased to have been received by my English brothers and sisters, and I would like to come to England again. But Anitza, Bukka, and Anatta make it impossible for us to be sure that we will have the opportunity of doing so. I hope that the Tamma we have discussed today will enable you to get the important essence, Zara, which will help you in your future practice. Venerable Banyawarto has been in Thailand for twelve years, so he speaks and understands Thai fluently. During that time I have tried to learn English from him, but I never really succeeded in learning it, so I am unable to speak to you in English during my stay here. I must have Venerable Banyawarto translate for me. Twelfth question, Man 3. You have had a chance to see the city of London, to see that it is a large and bustling city. I would like to ask if people can practice meditation in a city like London. Answer. Only the dead cannot practice meditation. As long as we are still alive, we will have the opportunity to practice meditation because we will have both times when we are busy and times when we are free. We are not burdened all the time. In speaking about human cities or countries, all of them are cities or countries of people who have mouths and stomachs, so they have to run about busily finding remedies which they need for making up the deficiencies in their bodily well-being. Because of that, there is bound to be restless confusion and milling about in the same way everywhere. No matter what town or country we go to, they are all running around busily in the same way all over the world, because making a living compels them to be like that. The only place where things are not busy is in a graveyard, the towns of the dead. But who would want to live in an unbusy place like that? Even animals do not want to go there. Therefore, when we need to live in a bustling city like London, we must bear it, because necessity forces us to do so. We see this happening everywhere in the world, where men and animals with mouths to feed struggle to survive. <laughs> 